there's no point to be a good team or like have that comeback story as Immortals if you're not also putting out content with it. So we want to make sure that everyone can see that we're really putting in that effort. Both three and one, both top of the standings. Give me your thoughts on how the, you think the game will go. There's a good chance that you didn't know that the LCS might be live right now when you're watching this video because it's Super Week, which means that we have games on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if the LCS is on right now and you didn't realize it, by all means, pause this and come back to it because we can talk about week two and previewing this week after you're done watching. So without further ado, welcome back to... Last week, I had certain expectations that I wanted to see from the various teams across the LCS. So I figured, why not kick off the week two reviews with directly comparing them to what I wanted to see from teams and whether they achieved that. Starting with Cloud9, I told them to make it entertaining. And they did. Most watched game of the split. A Vayne mid fifth pick with no other wave clear really on that team. Even though Vayne did pop off early and Jojo Pune got an early kill and you thought, wow, this might be the start of them just absolutely taking over this game. Uh, no, it wasn't. Cloud9 is no longer undefeated, suffering their first loss of the season to Shopify in the most Cloud9 way possible. Longtime C9 fans understand that, yeah, once you let your guard down with this team and think that they're going to go on a run, yeah, that's whenever you lose. It's not 2020 anymore where Cloud9 just has this unbelievable season where they just dominate all year. No, like modern Cloud9 gives up these games on occasion. They rarely lose to the top teams, but randomly just like in Immortals or Dig or in this case Shopify, just yeah. But ultimately they did exactly what I asked. They made it fun, they made it entertaining, and it was a thrilling game to watch. They notably dominated Saturday, so really kind of nothing to note there. But... I like what they did here. Don't just give up because you had one really bad draft. Keep experimenting with stuff like this. Maybe put Vayne in a better situation next time where you actually have like a better team around her. But beyond that, I like the fact that they're experimenting. You can lose as many of these games as you want so long as you keep winning in the postseason. Does this single game really matter? No. Learn from it, adapt, and keep evolving. I like it. For FlyQuest, we asked fiends or frauds, and the jury is very much still out on that answer. They won against a weaker Team Liquid team than we expected coming into the year, which you thought, okay, going into NRG should be a close matchup. And it wasn't. NRG just absolutely obliterated them in that game. Like, it wasn't even close in any lane, in any situation. And I got the chance to talk to Bwipo after he picked Darius as a counter to Dokla, and unfortunately it just didn't work out for FlyQuest. So here's his thoughts on where FlyQuest currently stands. Before we even get into the game, walk me through this week, because obviously first week with live patch, uh, everybody apparently adapting to it from the prior week. Like, what did you feel a difference coming into yesterday's game versus prior weeks, knowing that you just have one week of turnaround time? Oh, no, I mean, I mean, not too much, honestly. I mean, if anything, it's like a bit more convenient, I'd say, like being able to play like League on the live patch. Uh, I I think it's, it's nice. Like, it's nice to be able to just load in what you think. Like, you look at the patch notes, you think, oh, this looks strong. And then you like start playing that and you're like, oh, yeah, that felt great. Let's play that. Um, and then, you know, having to like kind of prep for the week in advance while simultaneously practicing the picks for the week before was never really something that like made sense i think yeah i mean it didn't it made sense because that's what you had to do but uh being able to play on live patch means that you can like uh kind of streamline your practice for the entire split rather than having to like have like a backlog of things that you need to work on when your weekend ends yeah I mean, we got to see two interesting picks from you this week with the Mordekaiser into Impact. Uh, mm -hmm. You played against Cassante, what, twice this weekend? And then yeah. played the Darius again today. I know things mm -hmm. didn't go your way today. Mm -hmm. Safe to say it was obviously, like, at least the beginnings of that happening were not because of anything that you did in lane. But what were your thoughts as, like, the failed dive bot lane happened and you're just sitting up there, you know, trying to farm and salvage it? I think I just didn't punish my lane hard enough 1v1. I think this matchup is like quite tricky 1v1 and I overestimated how much prep I like I didn't actually prep this matchup too much specifically. Like I prepped Darius, but I didn't prep this matchup. Uh, I just thought in this particular game when we when I looked at the first 3, uh, they needed to pick champions that jumped into us and I thought, well, uh with the bans that they threw at Olaf and, and Aatrox, I, I figured like this is still a pretty good Darius game. Um so I, I was just looking for for something uh, that would punish like a four or five hard engaged composition, and uh, I think Ivern was actually something that uh, made their game a lot more playable than if they had picked something that was like 
uh, very committed, hard engaged. Additionally, like let's say they take a nocturne or something, yeah. um, then my my campaign would have like popped off completely. So it was a nice find by their staff, um, especially because I just faced up Darius. Um, then again, I still think our composition was stronger. And like I said, I, I mean not like I said, but like you mentioned, like the whole situation bot side, I think was uh, exploded the game in a way that didn't benefit us. And that's okay. Sometimes you're gonna have games where you know things go wrong and. It's going to be hard to retain control over the game and you lose. It's a best of one in regular season. Uh, I think the number one thing that matters is how we come back from a loss. Um, because at the end of the day, resilience is something that you need in order to be successful in league. Yeah. Uh, especially coming to best of fives. Like you open your best of five with a game like this. How do you respond going into games two and three? So um, hmm. in general, not too happy with how I played. I think I played a pretty poor game. But uh, on the bright side for me, um, I'm happy that out of four games, this is like, like this has been a good reminder for me. Like, oh yeah, like, when I played this way uh, on TL, I always got punished and it always looked bad. And I guess it was just, it's good that the game that I decided to like play a bit more loose and, and fight champions without like full information and, and play a slow, like a faster game uh, was the game that bottom side kind of explode. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't feel so bad to have a bad game when I wasn't the only player on our team having a bad game. Like we can kind of all like, Come together and be like, yeah, I fucked. Like the, the first thing I said is my bad, guys. I didn't punish my lane hard enough. And the first thing I hear in comms is Busio going like, nah, man, I, I, like it was my bad. I, I completely griefed the game, and and you know what I mean, like yeah, finding one of the like if it rains it pours types thing. Like just let it exactly, all out. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that you know, it's nice to know that we're we're together in the sense that we we, we both agree that we could have played way better and we had a, quite a poor performance. So um, I'm just looking forward to the next week and just. Continuing to practice and play on stage, I'm, I'm, you know, for me personally, uh, I got diagnosed with the bronchitis last week, and I've oh, been so having sorry. fever. Like, yeah, I've been having fever for like half the week. I don't like talking about it too much. I'm just bringing it up. But um, you know, if you you know fans might be checking out my OPGG, wondering why I haven't been streaming, why I haven't been playing much solo queue, and I've just been having an awful week. So uh, hopefully, I mean, I feel much better right now. But like, you know, it's I'm almost there. I'm yeah, you're right on corner. that edge of getting over the hump. Where like yeah, you're not yeah, full yeah. energy, but you know it's on the mend. So uh, in general, I, I've just had an awful week, and still getting a one-one um, feels pretty good, honestly. Like that's my perspective. That's why I'm still very positive. It's like for me, like it's been really hard to give a hundred percent. And <laughs> yeah, it's just sorry. Right. No, you're good. <laughs> it, it's, it's it's been quite rough, honestly. So uh, for me personally. Um, just gonna try and really get through this, uh, get through this illness, and uh, when I when when I'm when I'm over it, fully prepare for week three and and come out swinging because I think I can do a lot more for my team than what I showed today. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is also a good game to like kind of re like you know get a get a bit better of a read of like what our identity should be. Yeah, I mean the only, the positive though of today is that you are not the only undefeated team to take the loss. Uh, not sure if you got to see any of the C9 yeah. game, but we had the the caps, um, the caps Dylan pick Vane mid lane <laughs> moment, which unfortunately yeah. also not his fault of how the the game went. But now it sets up the match for you with Cloud Nine next week. Both three and one, both top of the standings. Give me your thoughts on how that you think the game will go. I know you're obviously going to predict yourself to win, but how do you think it's going to get there? I mean, I don't want to get too give too much away because I think it's important that like when we come in with, with the strategy that like I, I think in general like for best of ones having a good strategy when it comes to pick and ban and how you want to execute the game is really important. Yeah. I think that kind of showed this game with 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 NRG as well. Like they really wanted to pick a strong bot lane, really focus on bot lane and kind of lock down inspired, make sure that he doesn't get to have a free free game and uh, that's going to uh, be their road to success. And um, you know, playing into C9, I think it's just going to be important that we. Uh, uh, just play a cohesive game together and make sure all of our players uh, kind of have the freedom to play their their own game. I think that that's in general something that we're really good at is when everyone gets to play their own, like, you know, are free in their decision making. We don't kind of have to always hover for every dive, always hover for every play. Um, sometimes just having the freedom to play your own game and the laners kind of figure it out themselves. Um, or the other way around, you know, like if Inspired needs help on a crab, you just tell him to like figure it out. And meanwhile, we're, we're trying to take an advantage in our own lanes. I, I think that's uh, something that our team does really well. And um, that's in, something that I, I think is important for us to be uh, successful in the LCS. Thank you so much for your time, man. Get, please, by all means, take some time off and get healthy. Like that's all Thank that you. matters more than anything. Thank Have you a very great much. afternoon.
For 100 Thieves, I wanted to see massive step ups in lane, and we somewhat had that, but we also didn't at the same time. Sniper notably had a phenomenal game against NRG in lane. It didn't end up leading to a victory for us, but it was a good performance. And considering it was on a tank where he got counterpicked and he still got two kills, yeah, that's pretty good. Meech is still struggling a little bit in lane, but leads ADCs in the league in damage per minute, at least in under the new patch. But in lane, like starting off pre-10 minutes, yeah, he's still down a little bit, so... Still some room for improvement, but again, if you want to see more on 100 Thieves, check out the Rendezvous. That's where you'll get everything on them. Dignitas. I was looking at Dove versus Quid. Would the matchup live up to the hype? And even though the game itself was a little bit more of a roll in the mud, it was still entertaining, with Dove making plays to try and get into the back line on Akali versus Meech, and Quid having pop-off plays on 100 Thieves' side. I don't think you could be mad with either of the mid laners in that particular game. That was amazing. It was incredibly fun to watch. So even though Dignitas did have an 0-2 week, I still think there were positive signs when you're looking at this team as a whole. Yes, they're technically tied for last place in the league, but there's still a ton of room to go, including three games this week and a whole other second round robin. I wouldn't be hitting the panic button yet if I'm a Dig fan. For Shopify, I was looking for Fake God to step it up and kind of rid this title that he has of like academy stomper and lcs hasn't fully performed yet and they notably got a win against the best team in the league but i'm not gonna say that that was purely on fake god performing incredibly well i'm gonna say that was a full team effort and a really good draft on their part here's the thing with shopify a win over c9 means a lot but the problem is if that's gonna be like a one-off thing and you still lose to the teams around you then it really doesn't mean much time will tell how that victory ages will it be a one-off or will it be the start of something for shopify to really kick it back into form. Bevoy in his first game looked a little bit iffy, but in the Cloud9 series, I mean, that dive bot lane single handedly won them that game from that point forward. Bevoy played incredibly well versus C9, and I'm curious to see if he continues to level up as we go on in the season, because again, this is only going to be his second week. If he continues to grow, then great. Like, we could actually have a Dark Horse in Shopify that could potentially upset some of the better bot lanes in this league. For Team Liquid, the question was, would they find consistency? And the answer was, fuck no, they did not. It is still so up and down with this team as it feels like it has been for years where you have this positive step where they win a game you just have these moments where they fumble it like against FlyQuest like a matchup where you really want to see them step up and perform to that level and they just couldn't do it and then they go up against Immortals and then just win that game for Immortals the only thing was to make it interesting and they definitely did they very easily could have gone 2-0 this week they had a lead at 33 minutes against Team Liquid in their game but unfortunately fumbled it away so after a pretty positive one in one week, I got the chance to talk to one of their assistant coaches, Joey, who had this to say about both Immortals as in the players and Immortals the org itself. I know one in one week this week, but overall, at least from the outside public narrative, seems like a step in a really good direction compared to where people's thoughts and opinions were last week. What's your thoughts after both games, after obviously the win yesterday and then the, I'd say pretty close loss today. Yeah, I mean, going into it, we realized that we had a lot of stage jumps in the first week. We weren't really playing like ourselves in scrim or anything like that. And we tried to really like tell our players, hey, you just guys have to send it. You have to be willing to send it. Be much more like no one wants to lose being a, a team that just sits there and does nothing. And you just lose the game with no proactive plays. So we really pushed in practice being proactive and making sure that our players like understood like, hey, it's okay to take risks. It's okay to fail and all this stuff. And we had a really successful week of scrims this, uh, this week. <laughs> said week so many times um, so we were pretty confident going into this week we knew that against uh shopify that we probably had pretty good odds to beat them and then tl i think they're in a little rough patch and i you, today one or two team fights goes a different way we beat them and kind of sucks to lose to them it was a really heartbreaking loss honestly but i mean we're taking it one one better than zero two yeah that's fair i mean you guys had i think you were one of the only teams that really prioritized the ezreal this week versus mm -hmm really anybody else was that like is that a direct result of getting a lot of time with that on live patch or was it something that just your team was naturally comfortable with uh i'd say it's more of a natural comfortable thing it's kind of hard to be ready for the live patch because we only had three or four days to scrim yeah. on this live patch before it actually goes out um so i mean I, eddie's been a great ezreal throughout his career in my opinion so to just lock it in for him he was already confident to play it so we slotted it in scrims had some practice with it so I got buffed. It's strong. So works well with our team. Coming into this year, uh, you joined Immortals last year, correct? Like mid midway through 2023? Uh, as coaching staff, yes. I've been with Immortals since 2021 as an academy player. Yeah. Um, and then I transitioned into coaching last year. 
So you've been with Eeyore for a bit then on both sides. What do you think is the biggest difference this year with Immortals versus prior years? Like as the organization as a whole, the League of Legends sector? Um, Honestly, I think it's just kind of who's in charge. We have a, a really great... I don't... <laughs> His role has changed so much since he's been in Immortals, but uh, this guy, Vince, he's been really turning it around here, I think. He really cares about the players and making sure that we're in an environment that's comfortable. We really care about uh, making sure that we're setting up everyone to succeed and uh, taking the correct steps to make that. We're trying to make good roster moves. We're trying to make good staff moves and all that stuff. Um, I think that's really been the biggest change for Immortals. Uh, it's just kind of who's been at the top, and it feels like it's been a bit more successful now uh, that he's been slotted into that role. Your guys' content's been really good as well. I don't know if you've gotten uh, feedback from that or if like you guys have heard it directly, but I just want to make sure it's no like the video, you, <laughs> the video you guys do, the video you guys put out, and then like the TikTok trends that you guys have been doing have been phenomenal. So please, do not yeah. stop doing them by any means. We hired a new social media manager. She was previously with Golden Guardians, um, and she's been doing really good. Charlie's been pumping out content. Um, we have Bahan as well. He's like our editor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they've been doing a really good job. It's been everybody like pitching ideas and stuff like that. We really want to make sure the community knows that we're here. And like, there's no point to be a good team or like have that comeback story as Immortals if you're not also putting out content with it. So we want to make sure that everyone can see that we're really putting in that effort. Is there one trend that you've wanted to try that HR or anybody else has not approved of yet that I can help publicly put pressure on to make happen? If I speak, I'm in big trouble. You know, the Max <laughs> Marini or whatever it is, the coach just says it. Uh, no, nothing that's like too insane, I would say. Um, there's a couple of things that are just like kind of funny or BM that would be funny to put out, but we just can't. Um, I do enjoy calling Shopify Spotify, but can't really be doing that one. I mean, well, you can't, but we can. <laughs> we can. I, I can start perpetuating that. Story. I mean, they might not like it if I do. They're going to block know. you on the interview list if you do that one. That's fine. That's on them. I hate to say it, but they, uh, like, not to be braggadocious at all, but, like, pr press is press. You need press no yeah, in every situation. True. Luckily, they have a, a Cloud Sicky who is a pretty big Shopify fan. Or, or mm -hmm. yeah, I said, Jesus, you got me thinking whether I said Spotify or Shopify. That's going to. That's going to be bad. I'm going to slip up on that a few times. Uh, I don't really have anything else specific for you other than just wanting to know, like, what has the transition from player to coach been like? We've seen a, lo a lot over the last few years of people making that transition. And for a while, it was kind of a meme, at least within the LCS. Mm -hmm. You didn't really see many, like, former players turned coaches, like, really ride that path to success quite well. What do you think makes the difference between a good, like a player that was good or even decent turn that tries to become a coach and it doesn't really work out versus a player that is able to successfully make that transition. I mean, I think there's a lot of like leadership skills that just aren't naturally to some esports players um, that you kind of need to have when you are a coach. For me, it was kind of this thing where over, you know, my time in the world, I was always like offered like, do you think you'd be good at coaching? Would you like coaching? Um, it's something I've always considered like transitioning to in my career because I've always been a I maybe ego, but I'm a smart player about the game and I just wasn't didn't have the hands to play LCS in a way. Um so I felt like it was a kind of natural transition to me. There's things that I just do because I just think it's right. And I think that um it's like the right thing to do as a coach and I was doing it as a player. Um so it, for me it kind of felt like a very natural transition. I haven't really had too many struggles with it. I thought it'd honestly be, be a little bit easier to be a coach than a player, but it's definitely a lot more work. You have to worry about five players rather than just yourself. Um, so me and Alex uh, Sharks are like really setting up the delegation of who's doing what and who's responsible for who to make sure that our players are performing at the best. Uh, did you happen to like take classes in public speaking or anything like that? Because you were one of the most well-spoken coaches that I think I've talked to. No, I'm a very uh, antisocial person, anxiety. Uh, I don't know. I, I actually get this a lot, which is weird to me. People like can't tell that I'm a super introverted person because of the way I speak and the way I am on like content and stuff like that. I, I stream and I make YouTube videos every once in a while. So I'm kind of used to like speaking, I guess, in mic and like yeah. hearing myself and like trying to represent myself in a way that is like that. So yeah, it, I I've never taken classes or anything. It, you just have very good vocal like inflections. Like you can tell emotion in your voice, which is not something that a lot of people mm. have. So that's why I wasn't mm. sure. I was like, maybe he has, maybe yeah, I don't no, know. I uh, yeah, I did the, the riot player training one back in the day, like in 2019, <laughs> where they like make sure you speak in the mic, don't use curse words. Ah, uh, well, the curse words I think people can wean away from. If there's a lesson yeah. to be learned from Call of Duty, it's that shit talk is shit talk, and that's good no matter what. <laughs> that's fair. Let me turn this over to you real quick. Anything you want to put out there? Anything you want to say uh, before Super Week next week? 
Um, just keep our eyes on Immortal. I think we have a hard super week next week. We have NRG, Cloud9, and 100 Thieves, I believe. Yeah. Um, I think just keep your eyes on us. I think we're a team that is going to really show up in these games, and I hope the fans kind of see that. And shout out to our sponsors, Progressive, and anybody else who sponsors us. Nice. Thank you so much, man. Have a great uh, rest of the week. Appreciate it. You too. Thanks for your time. Bye. And finally, NRG. Yeah. They smashed this week. Dominant games, both over 100 Thieves, even though 100 Thieves did have a position to win a few times during that game, and then just in a complete stomp over FlyQuest. I'm willing to give out the title of best bot lane in the LCS, hands down, bar none right now, to FBI and Huhi. Huhi got player of the week on broadcast, and FBI just absolutely put everybody in a body bag like it was obnoxious the leads he was getting in these games my eyes were on dokla coming into the week and interestingly enough he actually has the highest percentage of deaths of his team of any team or any top laner in the lcs i'm definitely looking for him and nrg to clean it up whenever it comes to some of these one-off deaths but beyond that they're looking like an absolute powerhouse that we thought they would it might have taken them a week to come into form but yeah they are solid. As for some quick notes around the LCS, again, a reminder, we are having a watch party here in New York City for this Sunday's games of the LCS at OSMYC, now at 4 p.m. because the LCS has shifted their start time back one hour, so it's no longer three, it is a 4 p.m. start time for every game going forward for the LCS. I will be there for the first game at OS, but then after that is my wife and I's 11 year anniversary together. We're gonna go out and grab dinner. So I'll be there to kick everything off, but then I have to spend obviously the evening with her. It's our special day. Viewership on week two was actually very consistent and good. And if they're making this time change to try and better optimize, AMA viewership, yeah, I think we're in a really good spot. Each and every game is good. Co-streams are doing incredible. Cadrill notably joined the fray this week. So between the Portuguese viewers that are coming from the CB LOL, Cadrill getting the LEC involved, it feels like we have a lot of positive momentum with LCS right now, and it's a good sign. But there is one bad one. There is notably going to be no road show for the LCS this spring. Finals will take place in the Riot Games Arena out in Los Angeles. They're not even going to a different spot in LA. There's apparently going to be efforts made to make this feel different than normal. But for us viewers at home, I'm probably going to make a separate video on the AMA that Mark Z did on the LCS YouTube, Twitch, etc. Answering some of the questions. But when it came to the road show, one of the things that he said is that there's a baseline cost that they assume each and every time that they put on one of these road shows and that it is just too high at this point for them to warrant two road shows. When questioned further about whether they would drop that minimum cost to, you know, give away a few things in production value for the sake of going to like a smaller venue or take away some of the bells and whistles, it's like, no, apparently Riot has a standard set that they want, whether that's fair or realistic to the current times up to everyone else's choice. Ultimately, Riot's making the bed that they lay in there. But my question and follow-up will be, okay, so your costs are here. Why are we not doing anything to boost revenues? Because I really don't think the cost, while it's obviously a major factor here, that's not the thing that you can have the most amount of change and impact on long-term. It's the revenue portion. Why aren't you seeing more revenue per fan that comes to the arena that would help offset these costs or are your costs really like that realistically high that there's no world where if we have 10,000 people in an arena or even say just 5,000 uh, that we can't make that work? If so, what costs are you dealing with here? I get you want to make the broadcast look great, but like surely, you know, that's unsustainable and you I'm not getting into the whole you need to travel for road trips. If you want that, we talked about it for an hour on the crossover podcast. I laid out all my thoughts and opinions on that. I don't want to double dip on this. So without further ado, let's get into Super Week of the LCS. Three games for every team this week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Rather than going through the individual teams, we're just going to take a look and I'm going to address a few specific call out points that I want to note. First, who has the hardest schedule of any team this weekend with three games. I would say Immortals bar none. You have one game against a opponent that most people would consider close in 100 Thieves, but then you face the top two teams in the league. Yeah, they got screwed on this one. So it's really going to be a tough week for them. And an 0-3 here could potentially screw them out of playoffs. While it is still early on, technically, at the end of this week, we'll be through the first round Robin. And if you're three or four games behind that sixth place spot, you only have seven games left you have a massive hole to dig yourself out of so you need to try and pick up a win this week specifically against 100 thieves or even if you can take one off of the bigger two then great but like you're at like season saving mode already any team with one win and if they potentially walk out of this weekend still with one win 
is a problem. The easiest schedule for this week, I would actually argue, goes to 100 Thieves. You have one really tough game against FlyQuest, who is a top three team that we all expect to be pretty decent and rebound fairly well from their NRG matchup where they got beat pretty bad. But beyond that, then you have Shopify and you have Immortals, two teams that if you really are in like that fourth, fifth seed, you should be able to beat the two teams below you. Now, granted, it could be close. It could get a little bit sloppy. But at the end of the day, if you can walk out of this week 2-1 or a potential 3-0, if you figure out a way to upset FlyQuest, 100 Thieves fans are going to be riding high, especially after the heist made its series return which if you haven't seen that that's up on the 100 thieves youtube channel right now finally i've got two games to watch this week i think these are the two that you do not want to miss under any circumstances first and foremost is nrg versus team liquid even though we're seeing nrg step up team liquid once again just one of those teams that occasionally bounces back and performs really well the overall record between these two since nrg came into the league last summer and took over for clg and made the ignore change is 5-3 in favor of nrg this is a rematch from worlds if you recall correctly they had a best of one there and nrg took it it has been a while since team liquid got a pretty good win over nrg and this would be one that would help change the narrative and storylines of the entire season i don't know what hurdle they've had against nrg lately why nrg's just had their number every time but if you want to contend this is one that you got to be able to pull off at some point because as we've already shown the difference between winning and losing a best of one at worlds is potentially the difference between going home or not so yeah play this game as if you're back in korea and the stakes are as high as ever the majority of the rosters are exactly the same so this feels like a pretty good rematch and second is the game that everybody should have circled is flyquest versus cloud nine had flyquest not lost in the fashion that they did to nrg i think this series would have been hyped through the roof but now it's more about can FlyQuest bounce back and actually take on one of the perennial top two. If you're going to establish yourself as a contender, this is one where you at least need to play it close. If you think back to last year when NRG made their run, NRG was able to beat so many of the top teams, but then would throw away games against the bottom teams. We all question whether it would click come playoffs, and luckily it did. But it's not often that we see teams lose against the top teams, win against the bottom ones, and then bat above their weight after that. Typically, the teams that have even made runs and playoffs from lower in the standings have had those moments where they've looked good in the regular season against some of those top teams. So for FlyQuest here, all eyes are on you to put up numbers or at least do something against Cloud9. If you get beaten the same way that you did against NRG, obviously there's still a ton of time for this roster to develop, but it does take away from some of the hype and potential that people had for this roster, at least early on. So that's a wrap for everything on the pit this week. Sad news with the LCS roadshows, but overall a pretty exciting weekend to come if you haven't already be sure to drop a like down below hit that subscribe button and i will see you on the next video including my reactions to all the 100 thieves games which will be live the day after the games are played so starting for today's game tomorrow anyways adios see you later